okay. So, 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 so me and Kyle will just sort of have a conversation. I'm assuming Kyle is uh, armed with loads of questions and comments and observations. Yeah, well, I've got your book open. I got the PDF here. There are 88 comments. And I woke up earlier today to try to kind of organize them. And I think I have eight pages worth of copy and pasted crap. Did you just say questions. 88 comments? Yes. So, so that's more than one comment a minute. Um, yeah, we want to hear till about quarter past five. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So and, not only and we I would have, like to take some comments from the audience as well. Yeah, not only do I have yeah. 88 comments, oh. I tried to kind of synthesize them earlier. And I think I got through chapter three and a half. Okay. I was like, I think it's just going to be a random, I'm going to bring up yeah. cool stuff and then other people can bring up cool stuff. I think that's too many comments. Um, <laughs> that sounds like a book, almost. That sounds like peer review too. <laughs> that's that the short version. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Resubmit with major corrections. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what no, is. no, no. Not those kinds of comments. Just talking point comments. Is anybody <laughs> here from OUP? <laughs> uh, I can't see anyone. I can see Lauren Griffith. Hi, Lauren. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. Oh. I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> um, we, we're going to start in a minute, I think. Um, we haven't, I, th I think I need to just basically be quiet because Kyle seems to have quite a lot to say about, about this. No, there'll be a lot of places for you to explicitly talk. They're jumping oh. off points. Okay. Um, I mean, I could, I could loosely begin. I, we could, we, I could begin gently, seeing as we're all here. Um, I could, uh, I could say, um, you know, thank you, um, thank you very much for taking the time to come and listen to me and Kyle talk about uh, my latest book, um, which um, I'm very pleased with. And um, I, the story of the book is that I originally wanted to write this book um, a long time ago. Uh, I always wanted to write a book called The Invention of Martial Arts. Um, but I was advised by a, a very um, esteemed and venerable colleague called Professor Megan Morris that I should not write this book yet. I needed to, there were other things that needed to be done first. So I actually, I think I've written three books first since I first had the idea of this one. And it was a good idea because the thing that helped me most to write this book was a thing that we have at Cardiff University called CUROP, which is the Cardiff Undergraduate Research Opportunities Programme. So it's, it's a little scheme where you get a, an undergraduate research assistant through the, from when they finish their exams to late summer to, to undertake research for you. And I had over a period of three years, I had three research assistants who spent a few months each um, digging through various kinds of archive. Um, I, I, my first research assistant, Paul, was um, he researched the representation of martial arts in the British press. The newspapers and then my um my second research assistant was Gia and she researched martial arts across loads of media tv and cartoons and and that really became a, a core of the book in terms of its, its its historical um scope um my third research research assistant was mainly looking at um issues around self-defense and stuff which factored into into the book somewhat but i put my um table of contents behind me so if anyone wants to ask like well what's that chapter about what's that chapter about and I um it, so it, it's kind of written as a history but it's a history with a theoretical argument um the argument is that the notion of martial arts that seems so familiar and timeless to us is actually a very historically bounded concept it really emerged in the in anything like the way that we know it in the 19 the early 1970s Yes, it was possible in the English language to combine the word martial and the word arts, but the, and, and people did use it as a direct translation of, of Japanese terms, but it, so in that context martial arts was a good translation for bougay, but you would never, you didn't have the the um, sense of someone being a martial artist. They may do jujitsu, they may do bartitsu, they may do uh, judo, they may do boxing, they may do wrestling, 
but you didn't have people self-identifying as martial artists. There was no overarching in the English language concept of the martial artist and martial arts as what I call a discursive entity. So in the book, I tried to track that emergence. Um, and it, 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 even specialists, even specialist scholars of martial arts, history and culture and anthropology, they don't even start using the term martial arts in their book titles until about 1973. It all, I mean, it's like everything happens in 1973. Um, and so in the, the, the book is half history, half, uh, the, there's gonna be more than two halves to this, by the way, half history, half theoretical argument, and then half case studies and chapters that focus on things that I'd never really seen anyone writing about and that I really wanted to write about. So martial arts in adverts, martial arts in music videos um, and, arguments uh, also also and this is the really interesting thing for me the song everybody was kung fu fighting or kung fu fighting everybody knows this song everybody who has ever lived it seems knows this song and goes yay when it comes on and gets really excited about it and there are so many titles like academic book titles journal titles or that have this or some reference to this in them but there are no sustained textual analyses of that song that are worth you know anything other than a few fleeting comments so the song is everywhere but it's also kind of nowhere and it is a kind of god in that sense um it did so much to kind of produce uh, martial arts aesthetics kind of martial arts kind of um kitsch kind of popularized martial arts but also trivialized them so I, I, one of the chapters i enjoyed writing most was the chapter um everybody was kung fu citing which, which is based around the kind of textual reiterations across different media of that song and the effects that that had on, um, on, on the notion of martial arts discourse. Uh, there's chapters on uh, about MMA, there's lots of chapters about Tai Chi, um, Bartitsu, which was the, the kind of earliest jitsu to enter um, the British context in London in, in about 1898. That's kind of where the book starts. It doesn't go any further back than the late Victorian um, and then uh, Edwardian period, um, and I look at I look at what happened around the the the, for the world wars and in between the world wars, um, and the conclusion. But really, the starting point of martial arts is where you would expect it to be, about 1973. Um, I suspect Kyle's nodding, but I think that's one of those very patient nods that is actually uh, um, uh, something more of a yes, but kind of a nod. Um, so I think Kyle's probably read it closer than even I have read it. Um, so I, I, I just kind of invite Kyle to, to, to say what he wants to say, because I know that he's got a lot to say and I could ramble on, but um, let, let's, let's put me to the test and see, see if I can cut the mustard. <laughs> well, okay, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I don't, this is, for me, this is one of those books and very similar to Deconstructing Martial Arts where I really enjoy the thrust of it and I've always felt that at any point where I may disagree, the reason that I always enjoy reading Paul's stuff is because there's no way that you're going to get through a page where you don't start making connections and you don't start thinking about stuff yourself, either the same stuff that you've thought about obsessively too, like I like Bruce Lee too or stuff that I've never thought of that, but now this makes me think this, this makes me think that. So I always have sort of a positive spin, even if I get to a page and it's just in the comments, no, 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 it's still the feeling of, yes, this is interesting, this is something to think about, this is something that we should be talking about. So that's always the salutary effect of Paul's writing, especially something like this, which is so wide ranging. When you have a title like The Invention of Martial Arts, that's so huge. You know, there's gonna be so much stuff encompassed in there. So the stuff that I may disagree with, it's all still fascinating talking points, great stuff to work through for martial arts studies, cultural studies, media studies, all that stuff. So I feel like I have to say that at the top. So this doesn't feel like a viva or I'm putting my former professor in the hot seat. That's not what it's designed to be. It's just random thoughts that I have and the 88 comments that litter my PDF copy of the invention of martial arts, just so that we have stuff to talk about here and interesting things for you all to listen to having joined us for this talk. So it's not just two nerds obsessed about the same stuff talking by ourselves. So that's the general perspective that I have on this. Whenever I go through Paul's stuff, it's always very interesting. So in terms of what I have here and in terms of how we can structure this, 
I really don't have anything besides just here are cool things that I thought of while I was reading this. And then what do you, the author, have to say? And then hopefully that will be interesting to you all. And then I know we were told beforehand, if there are comments or questions or different ways to steer the conversation, just jump in and say, okay, shut up, Kyle, let's do this. So that's pretty much my idea of how we can move through with this conversation, if that's cool with Paul and everybody else. Yep, <clears throat> sounds good. It sounds good to me. Comment number one then, one of 88. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess a good place to start since it's early in the book and it becomes one of sort of the organizing concepts is the idea of origin, which seems connected to the idea of invention. And I kind of just want to ask more about your perspective on this. But before I just jump in, if you want to do something off the top of your head, I can read quotes too. But sort of the idea of the origin story and the importance of that, and then the idea of origin destinations and what that's like in the context of martial arts scholarship and sort of your take on that. Does that sound yeah. good as like a start? Yeah, I, I, I think we should start with the origins. Um, I... Uh... Uh, the, the section where I write about origins is also a section where I critique this obsession with origins. And, and I, I, I think one of my subheadings is the origin destination. And it's there's so much scholarship on martial arts, which is so fixated on the origin, the idea of the origin that it has nowhere else to go. And that, that the search for the origin equals the destination of the work and that if you have to go back to some mythical point or some yeah we've identified the actual time and place where someone said hey let's call this Wing Chun or or hey let's let's call this Kung Fu or whatever um, that becomes a, a true sort of fetish point so what my argument I always kind of polemicize or either directly or, or, or challenge the idea of this obsession with origins which seems to be particularly acute in martial arts scholarship, whether that's professional academia or kind of amateur obsessive scholarship. The idea with this, this quest for the, the origin, and this is not a critique of, of, of historical studies. I mean, there are some, some fabulous studies of the historical development of martial arts, uh, a specific, what we call now specific martial arts. But that's the point. It's like there are historical developments and profound kind of transformations in time and cross fertilizations that take place all the time. But what I challenge is the importance of, you know, finding the actual historical origin for everything, because it's it, it's it's not always as relevant as people seem to presuppose that it is. And it has effects on your scholarly position, it's like you become the person who knows the truth. And also you become, you, you kind of put yourself in the position of a gatekeeper of what actually is and what isn't. And I know this because I know the origin and therefore I know the truth, um, which this of course then immediately shades into my argument about why we can't really define in a kind of trans historical sense, what martial arts even are and why we shouldn't really fixate on defining them because th there's such a, a complex mush of things happening all the time to change things that just because we use you know one fixed term for something uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's even the same thing um, so yeah origins uh, it that my section on origins is really a section on why I'm not actually looking at origins or I'm not looking at the the, the kind of recognizable historical origins of, of, of certain martial arts like not really that interested in the actual history of jujitsu even though it's, it's really it's jujitsu when it arrives in London that interests me I don't really care I, I care about the cultural consequences of its arrival I care about who used it and what did they do with it and how is it represented and how it was articulated with feminism and, and how that became a kind of a political force in its own right that has next to nothing to do with Japan. Um, so, I mean, I could I could talk about this stuff. I, I, you know, we could go through all the martial arts and, and I could kind of, you know, rant about why I'm not interested in the origins of them. Um, but well, yeah, because I wanted to just have that on the record because then that does clear some things up, but then this is the part where I start to sound like a pedantic dork, but then there are interesting things where there start to be some issues with origins that the two things that I thought of were number one, with martial arts, there seems to be at least in the context of your sort of skepticism, 
a weird inverse of the relation that a lot of people have to religions. So a lot of times people will be suspicious of like new stuff, like Scientology. It's a classic stand-up joke material that, well, it's new. We can see the guy who invented it. So this is all ridiculous. But then you have really ancient old religions with origins that you can't really trace. And that gives people comfort that becomes where you invest your faith. Mm -hmm. With martial arts, it seems that the newer, the better. And it seems that what you're suspicious of are exactly these ancient origins and these claims for things being ancient. But it does still seem to be useful. And it seems that it is still a kind of organizing, I don't know, methodological point for you to determine certain origins in certain contexts. So like the investigation of Bartitsu is interesting because that kind of seems like an origin investigation. Like here's where the thing came from. Here's what it's understood as. And then here's how it was disseminated. So it seems as I read it, it doesn't seem that origins are the problem. It seems like ancient origins and specious claims for origins that contradict facts that we can find in historical investigations that don't have those kinds of ideological agendas or the kind of ideological baggage. It seems like that's more the thing that you don't like. It's not so much origin as such, but these silly ancient origins that you're just doing so people can come in and study Taekwondo at your place, that seems to be sort of where the scholarly axe is grinded. And that's kind yeah. of my take on that. Does that make that's sense it. or I, sound jive with what no, you're thinking? It, it makes sense. And there's an awful lot going on in what you say. And um, it does link up with, with so many different questions. I would say that in some martial arts, what is celebrated is the new. Not even celebrated, but but well, people get excited about it. So, but but these are also the martial arts that were more likely to call themselves combat sports. So, you know, in in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, if you can invent a new technique, then you will be like, you know, revered as a god for as long as that technique is is kind of tapping people out. But in in Aikido, you're not allowed to invent new techniques, right? You're not. So in Aikido, I was talking to to Josh Gold when we were in California. And I was, I asked him about this and he was said, you can't even, you can't even have a rear naked choke. You've got things in Aikido that are very similar to it, but you can't finish it off. You can't, because if you do that, it's not Aikido anymore. So that's pretty like, you know, that's, that's kind of, I always give like the Chinese martial arts a hard time for this, this sort of, this sort of uh, kind of ultra conservatism. But um, I think that in, in some martial arts, the ones that normally have the word traditional associated with them, there's a kind of veneration of, of the age of, of a technique or a combination of techniques or, a, or an approach to it, which becomes a kind of fetish. But on the one hand, it's a bit like respecting your elders. Like you don't mess with it because you shouldn't have the arrogance. To, this was the critique against Bruce Lee, wasn't it? How the hell? Does this guy think that Wing Chun and boxing and Taekwondo are incomplete systems? He hasn't got even a belt in these goddamn systems. He hasn't finished the syllabus. How can you judge Wing Chun as incomplete if you haven't finished the syllabus, right? Um, but on the other hand, um, Bruce Lee was, was very much, it always comes back to Bruce Lee for me, but it was very much a kind of uh, uh, someone who would study and try to get the sense of it and then try to develop it in different ways. So, the status of the old and the new, my problem with the old, and I'm, I was interviewing um, Lynette Hunter for the podcast a, a few weeks or a couple of months ago, and she asked me this question. She was like, why do you have a problem with things being old? And I said, well, because ideology and politics and ownership and blah, blah, blah. And she went, yeah, but what about traditional Chinese medicine? that's really old. And I was like, well, yeah, it really, it really is really old. Like I can't argue with that, but I think that it's, it's different to religions being old or, or religions apparently being old because it always comes down to the interpretation in the present of, of what the ancient is. I mean, you know, like, so I always talk about Jacques Derrida talks about teleopoesis, this kind of invention of a sense of ancient history to orientate yourself in the present, to direct yourself towards the future in a certain way. So things are ancient, but how you interpret them is very, very contemporary. You know, people will fight wars and kill each other over an interpretation of the Bible or which book should be in the Bible and which book should be out of the Bible. And that's a very old book, but it functions in the present 
in different ways, in different contexts. You can have very, very liberal Christianity, you can have a very, very oppressive Christianity uh, and, all, and all the things in between. So my hesitation before respecting history or respecting an appeal to the ancient is because that is always doing something in the present. It's always kind of politically um, consequential in the present. So I, I'm definitely not against history. Um, and I definitely I'm not doing a kind of like some kind of weird postmodern caricature where there is no history and there is no reality. What I want to, if it comes across that way, it's because I'm being kind of um, like there's a kind of hyperbole or an exaggeration to, to make the point as clearly as possible about the dangers of, of falling into this kind of quasi religious way of thinking about the past. But I don't think it's all, all martial arts. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, I've talked about Taekwondo before. Taekwondo should be a martial art that thoroughly embraces its own creativity because it's the thoroughly modern martial art, ultra athletic, ultra innovative, but, but it has a kind of schizoid relationship with its past. It wants to be mega ancient, but it still is evolving. And then going, oh no, because look, we've, we've just painted this picture that we're now going to say is 2000 years old and therefore of this technique, uh, we've made a start. <laughs> or oh, we put this bit in the form. <laughs> I love that. We've, there's a stat, there's a Korean statue where they've given it this and they go, look, but it's in this Taekwondo form as well, this pattern as well. So it proves how ancient the pattern is. And you go, no, no, it's, you just put it in there now. You just planted that move in the pattern that you just devised now. Uh, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff goes on in martial arts in different ways. So my relationship with history is, is not straightforward. It's, it's, it's skeptical. Um, which is not to deny that there are histories. Yeah, don't worry. If it sounded too postmodern, you know I wouldn't be able to bite my tongue on that. No. It's, that's not the case. <laughs> but since we were then skewing into ideas of sort of definition and actual practices of martial arts, reading one part here made me think of an experience of mine that can be a story that happened to me but maybe an interesting thought experiment for everyone else. And then an interesting talking point for you. Early on, you're talking about different practices that maybe aren't exactly martial arts practices and they're not techniques, but they're things that you may do as a martial artist or you may do in a martial arts context. And that was something that I found interesting where you're, the exact quote you're talking about, carrying out stretches before early morning taiji or qigong in the park, jumping rope or skipping to build stamina for sparring. And myriad other practices can all be regarded as martial arts activities. And you say stretching is not always a martial arts activity, nor is kneeling, nor is skipping, but they can be. And one of the things that I found interesting was this conflict is the reason that I stopped doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Muay Thai at the place where I was doing it because it drove me insane when I would go to the place where I'm paying someone money to teach me something and I'm wasting time doing sit-ups and push-ups and running around in a circle. Yeah. It drove me crazy. Yeah. And the last straw was a day when the guy who was teaching us, who he was at a little rec center for a little while, got enough money, opened up his own school, but then that meant more responsibilities. So we started being taught by like senior students, just douchebag dudes. And we were doing a Muay Thai class and we were doing cable shots. So where you put like the harness on and you're doing wrestling double legs with that kind of resistance. It was driving me nuts. It was also exhausting me because I'm not a wrestler. I've never done this cable shot in my life. And now with 15 minutes left of an hour long session, now we bust out the tie pads. Now we start throwing kicks. Drove me insane. And I almost like got in a fight with this senior student who would have eaten me alive. But I was like, if I can just punch this guy once, I don't care if he puts me in the hospital. This is driving me insane. And it seems like the whole source of this conflict that 17 year old me was having in this little Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Muay Thai gym in a local strip mall was because I was having a problem with these things aren't the right activities. This is a Muay Thai class. Cable shots are not Muay Thai. This is martial arts. This isn't sit-ups and push-ups time. I can do that myself. So how do you relate these different ideas of sort of what constitutes a practice, what belongs here, what doesn't belong there? Any thoughts on that subject? Besides yep. just meeting a nutcase. Well, it's, it's you know, I, I, 
you have just given an insight into what I spend most of my time thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> like literally that's what's going on in my head all the time. I want to okay. fight, can I fight someone? Should I fight or should I stretch or what should I do? But I'm the Paul, same. You know, Paul, I, yeah. Paul, sorry. I'm just going to interject here because we have two questions relevant to what Kyle has just asked. So okay. one is for you to define what martial arts is. Yep. And the other one has to do with this idea that the West is in a way capitalizing to martial arts, westernizing it and fetishizing it for, for, for profit. So instead of doing martial arts, you end up doing the sit-ups. Okay. And no, I was going to ask the, the similar thing about if we forget the, the origins, maybe what we're doing is fetishization, it's orientalism and it's not really following. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, there's a, there is a lot going on here. And um, theoretically and conceptually, I would tend to invoke one or other or both of the concepts of the supplement as you know Jacques Derrida this is one of my all-time favorite go-to concepts that kind of gets me out of any jail free supplement and the Deleuzean notion of the of the assemblage insofar as you know there is no which you know you deconstruct the essence of something there is no you might feel like there's an essence to something there's a quintessence to something there's a different a different feeling of what what we're essentially about so if we for example no let's stick with assemblage and supplement first so you know a supplement a, 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 a practice is constituted by a, a sets of different um, supplementary activities always you skip, you stretch, you, you, you punch bags, you, you lift weights, you might go for a run, you, you know, whatever, you spar, you do some sparring. But even, even a really say, a really simple practice like Olympic lifting or power lifting, you know, you, you don't just do those Olympic lifts or the power lifts to do that. You spend a lot of time on these kind of auxiliary supplementary exercises that might target specific parts of your body so so even the the most simple practice like you know like a, a clean and press or a clean and jerk or something or a, or a bench press or a deadlift is trained by by way of a, a multiple kind of assemblage of different supplementary practices dietary chemical you know you know scientific based and so on um and so there is no essence to any one single practice it's always some kind of assemblage well, what that but we do still nonetheless have the sense of the essence of something so you you were frustrated with with um with muay thai training when you're 17 i used to go down to tai chi for a long time and and it would drive me nuts that people wanted to do the form by themselves and i'm like we've been in our own homes for a week guys this is our one chance let's fight let's just fight let's not do anything else but fight However, is that the is push hands and so on? Is that the essence of Tai Chi? It's certainly it's certainly a, a supplement to the practice that that I that I needed to have and that I sought and that I desired. I'd be frustrated if I leave uh, a club without without fighting or rolling or sparring or whatever. Um, but now, I mean, after a year of lockdown, more or less constant lockdown, the the for me the quintessence of my Tai Chi practice involves the relationship between standing qigong, standing still qigong and Tai Chi form in different ways. So the search for the, the essence or the core of the practice is something that's always gonna shift around within a structure of supplementary practices, depending on when your investments and where your values and investments lie. In terms of, there were questions about defining. So this is why, this is why you can't define the martial arts because a new piece of kit comes along, a new technique comes along, someone invents a TRX, someone invents a Peloton, someone invents a blah, blah, blah. Someone in Wim Hof invents a new way of getting high off breathing and having cold showers. And all of these things can be factored into the practice in a way that enriches it or transforms it. And this is like Derrida's argument about the supplement. Again, the supplement for Derrida is always dangerous because it always threatens to pervert the entity into something else. So when Derrida reads Rousseau or reads, you know, whoever he's reading on the supplement, uh, you know, like if, so if in Rousseau, like heterosexual sex is proper and procreative heterosexual, that's the proper, then masturbation is the danger because you could end up just being on your own, being a wanker in your own bedroom or whatever, rather than getting out there and, and procreating heterosexually. So, you know, this can be true of anything. Like you, you might do weightlifting to supplement your martial arts practice, but then you might get much more into your weightlifting and forget about the martial arts practice. And I spend a hell of a lot of my time just asking myself, am I training martial arts now or am I training strength? 
what am I actually doing here? And I don't know. So when it comes to defining, um, that's one of the reasons why I don't define because the discursive entity shifts. It's a, it's a shape shifter. Is Tai Chi a martial art? Well, mm, sometimes if you train it as one, is Qigong part of martial arts? Well, it depends who you ask because some people, some real combative martial artists would, in, would say that Qigong is absolutely core to the martial side of their practice. You know, people who do things like Krav Maga are, are, are gonna spend more time in practices like CrossFit and, and you know, crawling around in bushes than, and hedgerows and things, <laughs> hiding than, uh, <laughs> that, you know, and worrying about room clearance. Is that a martial art? So that's, that's why I don't define it. Question about, there was a question about Orientalism and, and capitalizing on things. Um, I haven't read the question, but from what I remember about the question, it seemed to be formed in a kind of East-West sort of a way. Um, and I think that you have to remember with Orientalism that the people who are most active in Orientalism today are the Chinese, Japanese, the Koreans, East Asians who are massively commodifying themselves. Uh, especially when it comes to things like martial arts and movies. It's not Westerners who are doing Orientalism now. It's, you know, Orientalism is self-Orientalism most of the time because that is fungible, tradable. That's, that's, that's valuable stock, you know, that's, that, that's a valuable commodity. Um, Westerners do still Orientalize and fetishize and fantasize about the mystical Orient uh, and mystical Oriental practices, but, but that demand is met by supply. Um, and if we could trace that back to its origins, but it's a kind, it's just a sort of functional um, entity now, isn't it? Um, there's a lot we could say about that. Did I miss anything in that? Or should we, should we, does anyone else want to ask? Or does Kyle want to say something? Um, I always have more stuff to talk about. So you <laughs> just give me the sign and I'll keep going. Uh, I'm easy yeah, either, I guess, way, either way. <clears throat> yeah, I guess that Another interesting thing that I wanted to bring up, because this is one of those examples of what I mentioned before about I'm reading something and I never thought of that, but that's true. And then that makes me think of this. So just something that I wanted to bring up and sort of your ideas on it, other implications, other examples, because I thought of a few, but I love the idea. I don't know what chapter I'm in. It's page 142. So a later chapter, but that's where you're talking about martial arts and gender, broadly speaking and talking about different sort of masculine icons of martial arts, different feminine martial arts practices. And there's the idea about martial arts being invisible. And I thought that was a very interesting observation. I never thought of that before. So the exact quote for people who don't obsessively read through Paul's stuff and memorize passages like I do, the actual quote is, this is namely that cinematic cellular te television martial arts females are overwhelmingly presented as not merely normal women, but actually hyper feminine females with none of the obvious visual trappings of being a fighter. So the way that Bruce Lee has to take a shirt off and show all of his muscles and you go, well, this guy's probably gonna be pretty good at whatever he's gonna do because he looks like it. There's sort of a different representational, I don't know, semiotics or syntax at work with female martial artists. And this illustrates both the truth and a key ingredient of the myth of martial arts, fighting skill and ability is invisible. So that instantly made me start thinking and going through the catalog of martial arts movies that I've seen. And there's the quick little scene in Enter the Dragon when one of Han's daughters flips Roper. It's like, well, this is just a pretty girl. I'm gonna shake her hand. And then holy shit, she does martial arts, just totally takes her by surprise. And because the new Mortal Kombat just came out on HBO Max, it's horrible people, don't watch that. Just watch the original movies because they're better. But in Mortal Kombat Annihilation, there's an interesting thing where Liu Kang, the essentially stand in for Bruce Lee from Enter the Dragon, sees a woman show up wearing not much clothing at all. And she's just this kind of sex object. And then all of a sudden she transforms into her jade costume and you realize, oh, now there are visual markers there. Now I understand that she does martial arts, but beforehand that was invisible. So there's sort of that heterosexual idea of, well, this is just a sex object. There's no martial arts there. So all of these different examples even multiplied into the, there are two scenes in two different movies. So it's kind of a common thing that shows up in the black exploitation classic Cleopatra Jones and in the Hong Kong martial arts film with Cynthia Rothrock and Michelle Yeoh. Yes, madam, women show up, they're in an airport, a crazy conflict happens. And all of a sudden this beautiful woman is kicking everybody's ass. And you're like, who is this person and how are they doing this? So that idea of martial arts being invisible, number one, 
And then that kind of invisibility connecting to female martial artists, and I guess what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a woman martial artist, all of those different ideas and implications immediately started going off in my brain when I read that passage. So I just figured any elaborations on that or ideas with those other examples are sort of where you got that idea. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I got the idea, but it's um, it, it's a it's a very. Uh, I was just talking about something similar in my um, undergraduate uh, seminar yesterday with Jonas, who is who is here with us today, and I, I've. We we're talking about different because the module is called body image and it's about you know the body and the image and so on and and I, I i heard myself saying yes i would everyone would i'd love to look like a bodybuilder but i want to feel like a martial artist right because because the type of training is different and the whole orientation of the training you know after a martial artsy type workout you can come away feeling like you can fly like you can bounce like you're made of rubber like you can you, you just but after a, a you know a, a bodybuilding workout or a weightlifting workout, you come away feeling like you're ruined and you just fit for nothing and you can't move and you're seizing up and everything. But I I just found it. Um, I mean this this th there are cinematic conventions of the body and martial skill. So that during the period that you know focused on by people like Yvonne Tasker, the spectacular bodies, the kind of Stallones and and, and Schwarzeneggers and. Um, and Van Damme period of, of, of the 80s, the, the, the American martial body is, is the six pack body, it's the lean body, it's the steroided up body, it's the kind of diuretic taking, you know, human growth hormone ingesting um, body. But then if you, if you look, say at the, we were talking about, I was talking about this with Jonas yesterday again, the, um, this, the Ip Man cycle of films, I mean, there's different directors for the different different Ip Man films, but in the in in Ip Man, Ip Man Two, Ip Man, his body is always covered in much the way that Jet Li's body is always covered, or Jackie Chan's body is covered. But Bruce Lee's body wasn't because Bruce Lee was that kind of physicality. But say Ip Man plays the almost Confucian gent, the the, the, the scholar, the gentleman. He's a gentleman, and then he fights arrogant Englishmen. Mike Tyson, you know, he, 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 who, who are all representing a culture that is 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 being um, communicated through its most simplistic markers. Um, we also talked about the voice that you know that if you if you listen to the the voices of Westerners in Hong Kong martial arts films, like the Hong Kong filmmakers through from the seventies onwards, just all they saw and heard were like big arrogant people shouting. <laughs> That's what the British were, or Americans, just shouting all the time, shouting. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, but the female, the female in the, the the female martial artist is is it's always kind of buffy. It's always someone whose physical, technical, embodied skills and power is not visible unless they're playing a quirky superhero type, you know, like like in. Um, in Deadpool or something like that, where it's marked as strength or marked as butch. Um, and I just found that interesting and needed to be discussed or and I wanted to start a conversation about it in some way. There are conversations about gender in this way, but it's, 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 it was just interesting to me. I don't really think I take it anywhere of the other than just these observations about like the, the female martial artist, no matter how powerful and how lethal whether she's Wonder Woman or whether it's Bruce Lee's sister in in End of the Dragon, it, it's it's physically unmarked, unless I'm unless I'm not watching the right films.